Now, she got, for a while, she got very high prices. Uh, in 1873, a New Orleans paper reported that she had two $50,000 commissions. It became very fashionable to visit her studio and she would uh, wear, this is some of the things people said about her, she'd wear a red cap in the studio, and she was described as having an intelligent face. Huh? <laughs> Why not? Um, was it a surprise that a person of uh, African descent could have, an, could be intelligent? Yes, it probably was for many people. And so they were paying her a compliment by saying she had an intelligent face. Um, and it's much better than not saying it, I guess. Um, she was described as having African features, but straight Indian hair. So you know, she, her appearance uh, um, was tied into, naturally, uh, her uh, genetic uh, father and mother. And uh, this is what uh, one newspaper said about her. She has the proud spirit of her Indian ancestors. And if she has more of the African in her personal appearance, she has more of the Indian in her character. Now, what does that mean? Well, they're romanticizing the Indians. Is that something negative? <laughs> well, yeah, that would be probably, probably is at any rate. This was another thing they said in the paper. Her manners are childlike, simple, and most winning and pleasing. Oh, my goodness. Um, Childlike? Well, remember there was this attitude that uh, uh, African Americans and, and Africans, you know, people with, uh, from African heritage, were somehow uh, closer to nature, more like a child, uh, simpler in intelligence, maybe not intelligent at all. Um, and, uh, you know, you always think sort of the, the Uncle, Uncle Tom is, is trying to be winning and pleasing. Um, once again, for a 19th century, they are being polite. Um, if they said that today, <laughs> you'd have the same reaction that I did. <laughs> um, my goodness. <laughs> Interestingly enough, those kind of qualities, childlike, simple, are qualities that women were supposed to have. They weren't supposed to be as intelligent. You know, they're supposed to be dainty and remain childlike. Uh, and they're supposed to be winning and pleasing. So she probably cultivated manners that were winning and pleasing um, because that would certainly uh, help her in her career. If she was abrasive or too arrogant, uh, so certainly they would come down on her. Uh, but she succeeded uh, in her career, at least for uh, many decades. So we do have uh, some racial and gender stereotyping. Hosmer herself was also described as childlike. Um, from everything we know about Hosmer, I, you know, I, I, well, she was a tomboy, so maybe so. <laughs> but uh, that idea of, of describing women artists as more like children than as intelligent, capable adults who are carrying on a difficult career successfully. And so I had to ask myself some questions, and I don't know the answers to these, but isn't it interesting? Um, did the women artists, did they actually try to appear less threatening? I mean, did they try to adopt a childlike pose so that they would appear less threatening? It, it could be. Um, I, I know I was always taught to do things like that, and I know that there are many times that uh, in certain situations uh, where, yeah, as a woman it's almost second nature to uh, try to be less threatening and not insist um, on you know, your presence or your personality. And if you do speak up, you, know, you often are said, oh, you're talking too much, or uh, you know, your ideas are ignored, or even your ideas are then picked up by a man and lauded, even though you were the one who was saying them. So you know, it's possible that they actually had to adopt that persona. But it could also be that the, you know, the writer is just putting his own um, prejudging, which is what prejudice is, his own assumptions about women and someone who is uh, black of African descent, that they have to be childlike, that that's their na natural character. Um, and of course, the word Negro and Negress uh, were, were, were polite. Uh, now you wouldn't use them, but I know uh, even during the 1950s, 
um, there were unpolite words and there were polite words. <laughs> um, and this is, of course, the 19th century. Henry James, the author, uh, talks about her. He says, one of the sisterhood, and by the sisterhood they're talking about the sisterhood of all of these um, sculptors, female sculptors who are in Rome, and, you know, forming a group. One of the sisterhood was a negress whose color picturesquely contrasted with that of her plastic material, was the pleading agent of her fame. Ooh. Well, I mean, there is that idea of, you know, she's dark, and that contrasts with the marble. But then he says that her color is the pleading agent of her fame, like she wouldn't be famous if she wasn't black. Well, certainly, just the idea that a woman who was black and could become a sculptor was probably mar a marvel. Um, there are a lot of ways you can, you can put down uh, a person and uh, suggesting that not her skill or her ideas uh, is the reason she's famous. I'm, I'm sure it helped that she was different and exotic, uh, but it also hurt, as we'll see. Um, you know, so she would have to overcome prejudice not just against women, but prejudice, prejudices against Native Americans and prejudices especially against African Americans. So um, that's an interesting statement. <laughs> I'll just leave it there. Um, one of her, well, this is the largest work of hers which has survived. Um, and it's called The Death of Cleopatra. It's about life size. Um, it dates from 1876, and it was believed lost. One of the books that I, when I started to prepare this, one of my, the books that I was reading about it said, oh, this has been lost. It was found <laughs> I mean, very, very recently. I think in the, but I think in the 1980s. I don't remember the exact date that it was found. Um, you can find it on their website. I think they do tell you. Um, it was found in a salvage yard. <laughs> and an art historian, I don't know what he was looking for, but he went in and he said, oh my goodness. And, um, you know, either recognize that this was something that should be preserved or recognize, may it, you know, may recognize what it was. Um, it was in bad condition. And so the restoration had to even replace parts. So. Um, when you're looking at the details, uh, keep in mind that it had been out in the weather for a hundred years. Uh, it is, is, and of course the carving, as we said, she doesn't do deep carving, so it was badly, badly worn. I think parts of it were broken off. The nose of the Sphinx was either worn or broken off. I think Cleopatra's nose was broken off too, which they have replaced. Um, but at any rate, um, it, was, it was badly damaged. And it had been painted white, I think, as well. I think it was another one of those things. Um, it was restored and is now in the National Museum of American Art in Washington, D.C. It has its own little room or alcove off the hall. Um, once again, you know, Cleopatra is an African queen. Now, she's not sub-Sahara African, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but there is that idea of the African queen. She is in some ways dignified and exotic. She's shown as dignified. Uh, the subject is exotic, and as you'll see, there's all sorts of decorations on her throne uh, that add to that feeling of being some kind of you know, exotic figure. Um, they tried to trace what had happened to the statue. It was exhibited in essentially the world's exhibition, exhibition, and it was put in storage, and the storage fees weren't paid, so evidently she could not afford to keep up the storage fees. And then it was sold off and it was sold to somebody who had a racehorse that was named Cleopatra, and he put it on the racehorse's grave. Um, and then when that site was going to be used for something else, they, um, they it ended up in a salvage yard. So it was badly damaged, badly worn, and had to be restored. Um, I'm showing you some of the, the pictures of it from uh, various points of view. Uh, I took the pictures, and of course, with the different lighting, they all came out sort of a yellowy gold. And I tried to, to 
uh, make the image look like marble, but I finally just decided to use grayscale. So uh, you can see that uh, Cleopatra is shown uh, seated. And we'll show some details. She has already been bitten by the asp. She's still holding the asp in her hand. Uh, but uh, she has died on her throne. And, um, you know, there's nothing untoward. She's not slumping over or something like this. Her head is just turned to the side. Uh, she could almost be uh, in a very dignified manner, sleeping. She's shown after death. And uh, in this little detail, you can just see the curving tail of the asp that she's holding in her hand. Uh, the costume and the throne have some uh, really exotic details. Here you can see the sandals that she's wearing that sort of curve up and over her feet. Uh, flower there, and of course, a cushion at her feet. Uh, she's wearing, of course, uh, classical Roman clothing, which would be perfectly appropriate. Uh, she has this uh, sort of uh, griffin carved on the edge of the throne, a uh, very exotic, uh, unusual kind of uh, form. And it becomes very lively. I mean, Cleopatra's dead and quiet and dignified, but the carving uh, sort of rears and uh, is, is quite a lively thing. And then there are these uh, heads, these sort of sphinx heads on the edge of the throne. Uh, they are badly worn. African motif there. You can see the drapery. Um, I thought it would be wise to compare it with uh, another work of uh, 19th century sculpture uh, using Cleopatra as a theme. Uh, Cleopatra was, once again, a theme that pops up in uh, 19th century literature as well as 19th century art. And one of the things that is, is still, you, you still read this every once in a while, is this theory that Cleopatra, and of course we're t talking about Cleopatra the seventh, who is the um, ruler of Egypt at the time of Julius Caesar, uh, Mark Anthony, and of course is eventually defeated uh, by uh, Octavian uh, at the Battle of Actium, and then uh, commits suicide rather be, than be led in a Roman triumph, uh, such as uh, Zenobia was. Um, since Egypt is in Africa, there was a theory that she had a black African origin, but that's not probably very accurate. The, the Ptolemaic dynasty, of which Cleopatra was the last ruling monarch of uh, Egypt before the uh, Romans completely took over, uh, the Ptolemaic dynasty was a Greek dynasty, or at least Macedonian, uh, because they were descended from Ptolemy, who was the general to Alexander the Great. Uh, after Alexander d uh, died um, in the fourth century BC, uh, his conquests were divided up among the generals. And uh, Ptolemy <laughs> got the richest prize of all, you know, Egypt. And uh, his descendants continued to rule uh, for about 400 years, a little more. Um, so she would have been of, of Greek descent. Um, however, uh, when William Wetmore Story creates his statue of Cleopatra, uh, he does give her slightly Africanized features. Uh, as you can see, he has uh, Cleopatra alive. Uh, she looks kind of morose. Uh, this is just before she kills herself, evidently. Um, and she's sort of leaning back in this, this contemplative pose. Uh, but there's again, a number of similarities. Uh, they're both neoclassical in form, so they're, they're uh, not uh, tremendously uh, emotive and dramatic. All that is going to be restrained. Uh, the emphasis is going to be on uh, the, the beauty of the form uh, with the draperies uh, you know, clinging to the body. And uh, so we see uh, Lewis has shown Cleopatra after her death, but still dignified. Uh, story has shown her before, and uh, it's not a very strong expression on her face of somebody who's about to be killed. Uh, very peaceful on Lewis's face. 